name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I grew up in a family of five kids. I was the youngest. We lived in Austin, and each summer, we'd go in the big Chevrolet station wagon, the big green Chevy, straight up Highway 35 to Minneapolis, and then over to Fargo, North Dakota, to visit our two sets of grandparents. Mom and Dad were in the front seat. My two brothers, two sisters, and me were in the back two seats. And in case you're not familiar with it, that's a pretty long drive. First, we kids would fight over who got to sit where in the car. Then when that was settled, uh, we each marked the exact parameters of our space in the car so that nobody could infringe. We didn't have any kind of technology back then to entertain us, which left us with plenty of time to complain, Mom, her leg is in my space. Or to say, he keeps touching me. Grievous offenses between siblings when they're young. I think those of you who are parents are probably familiar with this kind of behavior. It's pretty typical of children, especially when they're in the car for a long, long time, and they don't want to share, or they don't want to be touched, or they want the best seat every time, and they take their complaints to the highest authority, expecting to receive a favorable judgment for each infraction. That's kind of how children are, until they learn better, which takes some time and some maturity. Unfortunately, that is not only how children are, it is how human beings are. We might get better about it as we grow, hopefully, but some of this innate desire to be favored, to have the best for ourselves, not to have to share, and to be praised by the highest authority remains with us. Especially if we feel like we deserve to be noticed or to be honored and respected, to be placed a little bit higher than other people because we're older or we have been here longer or we've worked really hard or maybe we have achieved more. Then it seems only fair that we have the best seat or more say in what happens around here or higher standing in the community. The Pharisees, the super pious lay people, were good people. They led a reform movement in Judaism that was concerned with taking faith off of the written page and applying it to real lives in the people of believe, who were believers. I think they would have a lot in common with us today as we seek to live the way that Jesus lived, caring for our neighbors, feeding the hungry, finding ways to put our faith into action bringing God's word to life in our daily lives. That was their passion, too. But like us, they sometimes got a little bit stuck in determining who was doing the rituals and the faith properly. In the gospel reading, Jesus and his, his friends were taking wheat from the fields on the Sabbath. Now, it was likely that they hadn't maybe had any breakfast, and maybe they hadn't even eaten a whole lot the day before. What they were doing was they would pluck the wheat and then they would rub it in their hands like this so they could free the grain from the husks and then eat it. Not really a whole lot of work involved in that. But keeping the Sabbath was really crucial to life and self-identity in Israel in those days. Sabbath observance marked them as God's people. It oriented them away from other cultural norms, away from idols, false gods, away from alternative priorities, and toward the Lord God, who also rested on the seventh day and who had freed them from slavery, which had kept them at one time from ever getting to rest. Keeping Sabbath meant knowing and honoring who you were and who you belonged to. It was very important. Jesus knew that, and Jesus respected the commandment and its deep importance. But he also knew how people could be. Children, adults, pastors and priests, super pious lay people, all of us. Sometimes we just want to be right, stubbornly so. 
Sometimes we want to make sure that everybody else is following the rules that we've set out, makes the same sacrifices we feel like we have made. And we're not very willing to budge on that. Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? Jesus asked. They said nothing. And looking at these good people around him, Jesus flushed with anger. He felt sick and saddened at their hardness of heart. Sick and saddened at their hardness of heart. Why do we have to be like that sometimes? Then Jesus told the man to stretch out his crippled hand, and with a word he healed it. Now, did that healing have to be done on the Sabbath day? No. It could have waited till the next day. But must it wait when the man was right there and Jesus was right there and they were all in the synagogue where the word of God permeated the space, the word that calls us to love our neighbors as ourselves? Would we have wanted Jesus to wait if it was to heal us or to heal our beloved spouse or to heal our little child? Or need he only wait on the Sabbath when it was somebody else? This is the internal battle that we face between really important rituals and observances and people with their messy, complicated lives who are also important but sometimes really hard to deal with. Keeping the Sabbath was not trivial. It was not just the letter of the law that could be ignored when some excuse came up. It mattered then, and it should matter to us today to set aside a day for Sabbath, utterly different because God is utterly different from the ideology and the ways of this world. As people who worship God, who have been claimed by God, we are to keep one day a week to witness to that difference, a day of rest and delight, of not working, not worrying, not fighting with each other, not being slaves to commerce or technology or busyness, but a day for rest, for rejoicing in the gifts that God has given us, for enjoying all the blessings of God. That's important. And the way that we choose to do that, the way that we decide to have our rituals, that matters. That's important. But so do people, their hurts, their needs, their brokenness, even if it interrupts our Sabbath rest and rituals, even if it pushes us to rethink how we arrange our worship space or or who is fully welcome at our table or, or what it means, what it looks like to be this particular family of faith. Jesus got angry not because he didn't love the super pious lay people. He did. He loves us all the time, even when we're wrong. He was angry because he loved that man with the withered hand, and he wanted him to be whole right then. He was angry because he loved the Pharisees. He loved how they strived to embody their faith, but their hardness of heart at this moment grieved him. He was angry because his love for the human community is so deep that he wants the best for us and to see the best in us come out. My dear friends, Jesus loves you, all of you, so much. So celebrate the Sabbath with beauty and reverence, with joy and with your familiar traditions. And as you breathe in Jesus' deep, deep love for you, see also his love for people who are not like you, who mess things up, who get in your space, who do everything wrong and make you want to pull your hair out. That's the gospel, and it can be tough. But the love of God is so enduring, so constant, so real, for you and me, day in and day out, that the demands of the gospel are worth it. Nothing will ever separate you, ever, 
from God's love for you in Jesus Christ. You will always be held in that welcoming, embracing love. And that is a truth that is so amazing, so precious, so real, 